So uh, I want to thank um, Alex and, and the group for inviting me to speak today. I'm a computational biologist and, and certainly not an expert in network methodology. And our use of networks has been driven by a critical need to be able to look at very large sets of proteins and ask the question, if we look at the sequence and structure relationships in these proteins, can we use a large context, given all the data that's available now, to tease out uh, some of their functional properties and do we do better by that context? So I put this slide in as just a, a way to introduce where I'm going with this today, which is really how the networks that we're using are driving the biological questions. And in our view, the networks are a hypothesis machine. And that's what we've used them for. And that's been a very powerful way to get at this kind of information. Everything I'm going to show you today are static pictures. We, of course, Cytoscape is interactive. We build resources for biologists, especially enzymologists, to try to uh, explore structure function relationships. And so that interactive aspect is very important. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in relation to our database in a minute. So the motivation is to deduce functional trends from that context of sequence and structure similarity. So the networks I'm going to show you are based on pairwise comparisons of a very large number of sequences or as many structures as we have in a set of evolutionarily related proteins, and then asking from the groupings or the clusters we get out of that mapping those to functional attributes that we can pull down in an automated way or that we may have from experiment, can we make some inferences about the unknowns? The problems we work on are extremely difficult problems on, in functional inference for two reasons. One, we're looking frequently at sequences that may not have any close relatives with known functions. And second, they fall into uh, superfamilies of evolutionarily related proteins that all look alike at some level, so that distinguishing their, uh, in this case, enzyme reaction or substrate specificity turns out to be a really difficult job. So just very briefly, I'm going to give a little bit of background about how annotation of protein function is currently done and why it's a problem. And introduce uh, the, the network approaches that we're using from that context, tell you just a little bit about protein similarity networks themselves, because this is a fairly um, uh, small number of people are doing this sort of analysis using networks, and, and so I'll give you a little bit of background. I'm going to give you just a very few applications so you can see where we're going with this kind of uh, hypothesis and what we're learning from these, these large-scale global analyses, and then talk just a little bit about how that fits into a larger uh, public resource that uh, we've been developing. So the annotation problem here, and by this I mean functional annotation, has become a big data problem overnight. Of course, we know there's an exponential growth in the number of protein sequences available. Uh, but the microbiome projects and the metagenomic projects are beginning to completely dwarf this set of data. And so the question is, how are we going to start uh, digging into that data to figure out what these proteins do? The proportion for which annotations have been or can be experimentally validated is now becoming vanishingly small. So one of the problems we have is if we've got a set of proteins that we care about because perhaps they are receptors in some mammalian system, and we'd like to know we've got bacterial homologs, and we'd like to know what they're about and what they're doing. We have to choose which ones we're going to characterize. And that's actually a very difficult problem. One of the examples that we've seen uh, a number of times is that the well-characterized members of a protein superfamily are members that are real outliers in the whole set. And so using networks is a very nice way for us to identify whether the guys we're looking at or that we know something about are outliers and whether or not their features are indeed typical of the whole set and tell us something about their structure function relationships. We also have the problem of what's the proportion that are annotated with correct molecular function, what's the misannotation level. We published a paper a couple of years ago using a gold standard of 
a set of enzyme superfamilies where we knew a lot about them and we had a lot of experimental information. And for the kinds of proteins we're looking at, the misannotation levels, that is, proteins annotated in GenBank, Tremble, SwissProt, or KEG, with a particular uh, molecular function where we knew whether they really would do that function or not from our experimental data, could be up to 90 percent. So that's a really big problem. And when you think about indirect kinds of databases in indirect resources like KEG, where you're trying to put together metabolic pathways and you may have wrong annotations in those cases, it becomes a really frightening situation. So still the very, the fundamental way that molecular function is assigned in large public databases is based essentially on the assumption that what is conserved in a gene family is functionally important. This has been a fundamental dogma of structural biology for decades. And the inference here is that if, that sequence conservation infers structure conservation, which in turn infers function conservation. Now that's a simple rule, and of course it doesn't hold in all cases, and it gets complicated very quickly. But the application is that if you compare sequences or structures and can identify homologous relationships, that allows you to infer something about functional properties. So what I'm going to tell you about in the next uh, little section is where that's a difficult problem and why we have focused on that problem as a, as a, um, a research question, because we'd really like to understand how to do structure function mapping in the cases where we have a large number of related proteins, but we don't know what many of them do. So to do this kind of, uh, to do functional prediction, we have to identify the functional boundaries. And it turns out that functional boundaries frequently don't track with boundaries we see in clustering sequence or structural data. And that is really the center of the problem that we're trying to deal with. We, so what we want to be able to do is to cluster families or subgroups of families, families being sets of proteins that do the same reaction, whether it's a chemical reaction or some other uh, molecular function. And here we're working on molecular function because we're tied to the mapping to the sequence data or the structure data. We want to cluster those within each superfamily to define those functional boundaries. Well, there's a bunch of ways we can do that. We can build multiple alignments. We can look at conservation patterns in those multiple alignments, what's conserved in all of a very divergent set of sequences, and where differences might turn up in, in particular positions. Or we can build phylogenetic trees, which is really the standard in the field. There are a lot of different ways to do this well. And we can then associate particular functional classes with different uh, parts of the tree, as you see by the colors here. Orthogonal approaches which is really what we're capturing when we do look at expression analysis, protein-protein interactions, shared domains, fusion proteins, are from this perspective orthogonal approaches that we can then use to refine that functional assessment and try to get a higher quality answer. So a fundamental question in this study has been how has nature evolved many different chemical reactions, uh, the, the many different chemical reactions that living organisms require. And the set of, of proteins that we look at in trying to answer this question is a set that reuse a limited set of what we call privileged structural scaffolds. So what we mean by these privileged scaffolds is that a structural type here at alpha beta barrel with an additional domain this is actually very similar overall in fold, and in fact, quite similar in some conserved and important parts of the active site, evolved to catalyze two very different reactions. And in fact, in the superfamilies I'm going to talk to you about, those superfamilies may have evolved, these scaffolds may have evolved to catalyze 50 different reactions. And so the problem becomes, how do you count the reactions? How do you use some kind of clustering of sequence and structure information to even tell you how many might be there? And then how do you actually do that mapping? We call these sets of privileged scaffolds functionally diverse enzyme superfamilies. Enzymes are a good focus for our studies because 
they do chemistry. And that means we can get very explicit mappings between structural characteristics and functional characteristics. And we really need that sort of precise handle to give us a sense of how to tease out the answers to these questions. The number of reactions that are supported by a number of superfamilies, and I've just shown several different folds here uh, to note that this is not confined to a particular fold type, can be quite high. And these are estimates uh, in our case we have uh, deeply curated with the help of enzymologists, structural biologists, proteomics, many other disciplines, and about 20 of these superfamilies so far. And so our estimates of how many reactions each one of them may support are based on what we already know, and then our best guess, given the patterns we see in structure function mapping to make those counts. We've also asked the question, how many functionally diverse superfamilies are there? Because what we, one of the things we care about, not only in trying to understand the evolution of chemistry and metabolism, but we'd like to be able to provide guidance for protein engineering in the lab. So nature knows how to use the same scaffold and active site architecture over and over again to create new reactions. We like to know, since that knowledge in, in a, a very loose conceptual sense is embedded in that architecture, we'd like to know how nature did it in the hope that we might be able to use that information and leverage it for engineering in the lab. So we've tried to count how many of these kinds of superfamilies are functionally diverse. And by comparing the known enzyme classifications and the number of reactions that appear in each Superfamily class is defined by the SCOP database, which is a structural classification of proteins. We can say that about a third of enzyme superfamilies are functionally diverse. That is, they support more than one different overall chemical reactions. That's a big chunk of enzyme space, and it's got to be an undercount because we're only counting the known reactions, and we know we have a lot of unknowns in these superfamilies. An example, very quickly, uh, the enolase superfamily has now about 11,000 sequences found in all kingdoms of life. A big advantage for our network approaches is that we can look at all sequences in all organisms to give us a very big context from which to interpret structure function relationships. They have many different biological roles, and the pairwise identity of these proteins often is very low, so that sometimes we're comparing sets of proteins that are less than 15% identical to each other. And those are very difficult to work with, particularly in sequence space, because getting alignments at that level is very difficult. And for, for these kinds of proteins, we also don't have that many structures. So we can use models to try to leverage that information, but we are stuck with sequence information in many cases. So we can identify the overall similarity in this superfamily, the similarity in the active site, and in sequence space, we can identify some of those important conserved residues. So here are six of the different reactions that are catalyzed by members of the enolase superfamily. And I don't expect you all to be chemists, but you could probably see that these are really different reactions. And one of the reasons that 90% of these are mis of the proteins annotated as mandolate racemase in GenBank, for example, uh, they're misannotated as mandolate racemase, is that this was one of the founding members of the superfamily that we had identified. And so when we identified this guy, People did a blast and said, well, what's the closest characterized protein? I'm going to give it that function. And that, not formally, but, but semi-formally, we've been able to show that kind of error propagation is occurring. So these are the conserved residues in the active site of these six reactions. And as you can see, these are highly, highly similar. These proteins range from archaebacteria to higher uh, eukaryotes. Each color represents a different enzyme. And you see very similar machinery. So the question originally was, how does the same active site responsible for mediating all these different reactions? The answer is that this active site is associated with uh, uh, stabiliz stabilization of a similar kind of transition state associated with a partial reaction that starts the reaction in each case. 
So all of these reactions have a carbon atom alpha to a carboxylate group, and this active site evolved to abstract that proton and then stabilize the, the type of intermediate that, that ensued from that abstraction. So now we know something about the function of all 11,000 members in the superfamily, and that is that they all are going to have this substructure in their ligands. That tells us something about ligands we may want to consider <coughs> crystallizing proteins with to get <coughs> conformationally useful structures, for example. It also gives us some constraints on what kinds of chemistry all of these proteins are going to do, and that's a lot of functional information. Does it tell us the overall reaction? It doesn't distinguish these reactions, and it doesn't tell us the substrate. Predicting the functional boundaries for specificity, that is reaction specificity, and the substrate that's used is much harder. And that's because if we look at this conserved machinery in that active site, and we look at that substructure sitting, the pose in the active site is very locked in. But the rest of the ligand is all over the place here. And you would think this would be a straightforward way, a uh, straightforward task bioinformatically to distinguish the sequences that bound this ligand versus the sequences that bound that ligand. It turns out that's not straightforward at all, and it's partly because each of those different groups that represents a different chemical reaction may evolve at different rates from each other. And so our trees are not as informative in terms of being able to give us a nice direct mapping between correlation between functional properties and leaves we see in the tree or, or uh, uh, clades we see in the tree. So we want to do two things because we want to do this on a large scale now and predict functional properties and develop models for how function evolves from structural variation in this large number that represents a third of the enzyme superfamilies. And to do that, we've broken down the prediction of functional properties into uh, different levels of granularity. So if we know a, a, a sequence belongs to the superfamily, and we can define specific criteria for that, we can annotate it with the superfamily function and expect there to be some architecture in the active site that looks like this, and we know something about the function. If we can then, then, and here's that uh, set of, uh, of conserved residues here in the second picture, if we then know something about the specificity for a certain reaction, and that typically comes from some kind of experimental work, we could then assign families to these proteins. And in between, we can assign these proteins to different subgroups simply based on their sequence or structure similarities, which give us a, gives us a handle for doing this on a large scale. To do that, we've developed this structure function leakage <laughs> database, and we put this sort of information that I'm talking about in the database, and we have 13 publicly available superfamilies, several more we're working on, about a half a million sequences, but this is a tiny part of that enzyme universe, and it leaves our database what I call a boutique database, and we'd like to be able to extend this on a much larger scale to understand something about both natural and perhaps engineered evolution of new functions. So why protein similarity networks? We came to this because the superfamilies we're working with initially are way too large for us to manage using multiple sequence alignments in trees. So we're talking about 60,000 sequences in this superfamily maybe only 13 or 12,000 in these two, but that's a lot of sequences. Kinases, we have over 100,000, protein kinases, over 100,000 sequences. Proteins of the thyroid oxen fold class, again, about 100,000 sequences, and that's just the guys in GenBank. It's not the guys all of the, in the metagenomic projects. So we started to use protein similarity networks where we did a couple of things. The nodes are sequences, the edges are connections between the sequences that have a, a similarity better than some user-defined thresholds. And I'll tell you in a minute why we use thresholds and why they're important to these kinds of studies. So 
if you have a tree where you have functional classes and you can separate those classes mm -hmm. and everybody knows kind of how that works, we could do the same thing with the network. And so we could use a very permissive threshold. And here we're actually using E values as scores. And there's a reason for doing that that, that is associated with how we're presenting the information to our biologist users. We can use a permissive threshold and everything's connected because they're all in the same superfamily and we get a hairball. And as we use a more stringent threshold, we can explore different levels of similarity in the superfamily and start to pull that apart. And if we're lucky, the groupings we get out of that track with functional boundaries. <laughs> so for sequence, we actually use all by all pairwise blast. I'll show you. Uh, uh, so validation that in that, for that in a few minutes for how those distances uh, correlate with distances from trees and from multiple sequence alignments. If we use a very large number of divergent sequences, we get pretty good correlation. Uh, certainly good enough for us to use these networks as hypothesis generators, which is what our, our principal goal of them uh, for them is. We visualize using a cytoscape. Advantages are we get, we can handle many more sequences, as I mentioned. Uh, they're very fast to generate, so we can generate lots of them. They're very intuitively accessible to biologists, and I'll sh show you a couple of, of uh, pictures that, that give you a, a sense of that. And then, of course, associating the <laughs> networks with various types of metadata and orthogonal information and biological function gives us a context for interpreting the unknowns. So here is a set of uh, reactions from that superfamily I showed you at the beginning. To kind of complicate matters, there's a single set of enzymes that do both of these reactions in the same active site. They're truly promiscuous, not just for a different substrate, but for a different chemistry, which is quite unusual. And here's a phylogenetic tree that we built a number of years ago uh, where we were really only able to use about 50 sequences in building the tree because these guys are very, very distant. We had to go out and get some additional structures to get a good enough alignment that we felt we could even try to build a tree. It took weeks to run the tree at the time. This is a very labor-intensive effort. And then we've colored these. These red guys are, are these uh, proteins here. The blue guys do this reaction. and um, the green ones up here are the dipeptide epimerases. We have now pretty much filled out the functions of all of these using a combination of this kind of context, uh, uh, characterizing additional structures in silico docking from Matt Jacobson's group to predict function, and then high throughput screening to validate those predictions. So here is the network that we get that is comparable to this tree. So there are a number of things we get out of the networks that are really valuable. And one of the first things I want to mention, though, is a caveat. These are not based on an evolutionary model, as trees are, and they're not a substitute for trees. The kinds of uh, analyses we do is we start with the network to give us a sense of what proteins do we want to align, which ones do we need to get structures for, what are the ones that we actually want to experimentally characterize? And then we go to more rigorous and robust methods, including experiment. We build trees. We do structure-based comparisons. That's how those experiments work. Uh, it turns out that the relationships implied by the topology of the network agree quite well with uh, our trees. The cluster sizes, because we can sample much better, of course, are more informative, and they capture some of the details we care about. We get a feel for these. Uh, these are not really true hubs in these kinds of, of networks, but the representations we get here for this subset, we do see groups of sequences that are connecting multiple other groups. And that gives us really useful information about what sequences we want to have in our alignments to improve our trees, and to improve our ability to interpret the relationships. So I wanted to say something about layout uh, as part of this as well. Here is an edge-weighted layout which, in which the 
the length of the edges are, are uh, correlated with the distances between the nodes. I'm going to show you instead uh, the organic layout, which I know many of the Cytoscape people have hated for many years. The reason we like it is that we can't put this in a paper. It takes up too much space. It's really, really ugly. Biologists don't want to look at it and they don't want to use it. They get a lot out of this and, and I'll show you some of those useful pretty pictures as I go on. Why we use thresholded networks. A major goal we have is to summarize relationships, uh, summarize the connections between clusters instead of getting separated clusters, which is what we do when we do clustering. In fact, our BLAST-based analysis is not even clustering, it's just grouping based on BLAST. And that actually is very useful for, uh, for the hypotheses we're trying to develop. So if we use a non-stringent threshold, we get a hairball view. The nodes, the gray nodes are all unknowns and the colors represent different uh, reactions. As we change the E value, we start to distinguish some families. Here's the E value threshold is 1 times 10 to the minus 35. This is almost 3,000 sequences um, represented in this network as opposed to 50 in the tree, which is a really big difference. We start to see uh, these red guys, which are the, the O6-hilobenzoate synthases. They break apart uh, early. These evolve very much faster than anything else in the the network. And that was a very important observation for us to find because we couldn't understand, for a long time it, we didn't understand that all of these guys did this reaction. And we have confirmed that both by some experiment but also by the fact that these guys are in a pathway that's required for anaerobic respiration. And in many cases they're organized in operons. So the only proteins we had from this group in our tree were those that were in an operon context, and we had to use that because we didn't know that they did that reaction. They're so, so distant. We also see, and I think you can't see it from back there, but there are, there's a subset of guys that are pink, and they're the ones that do both of these reactions. It turns out that they fall into a particular uh, phylogenetic set, the, the firmicutes, and they're all here and they connect to the larger network much longer than the rest of the guys. And we in fact think that is important and tells us something about more general properties of this set of proteins from looking at them and their, their sequences and structures in detail. This central area is very confusing and difficult to sort out the functional boundaries. Um, it turns out that, well, I'll show you in the next one. Here we have a, a more stringent uh, uh, threshold to look at these. And it turns out that now we can start to see whole groups for which we have no characterization at all. So my group is part of a, a large um, consortium grant that's called the Enzyme Function Initiative. And the goal of that initiative is to develop structure uh, strategies for functional inference on a large scale that other scientists can use because we can't do all the experiments. And that includes uh, uh, metabolomics, proteomics, microbiology, structural biology, and five superfamilies we use as model systems with enzymologists who have deep expertise in those areas. And then the computational groups includes my group as a bioinformatics group in silico docking and homology mo modeling uh, as well. So we put a lot of different disciplines together to try to, to tease out these strategies. And so one of the important aspects of our work is to figure out which proteins we want to characterize structurally and experimentally. And one of the first things we want to know is where are the unknowns, that we know nothing about a particular group. Because until we have at least one structure and we can start to tease out some kind of uh, experimental information, we don't have a handle to start. I also wanted to note that this is the group now at this uh, E-value cutoff where we get these guys that are, have dual functionality coming off. But there's a second set of proteins that do this same reaction that come from a different intermediate ancestor in the tree. And that's another reason that these kinds of proteins are very difficult to correlate or make an assumption 
that functional boundaries will correlate with boundaries uh, from clustering sequence and structure. We have used um, basically a lot of trial and error and an enormous amount of, of intuition and experimental uh, information to begin to identify thresholds where we think we're starting to see monofunctional families. And that's what we're really going after. So this happens to be the threshold for the enolase superfamily. It's different for every superfamily. There is not a general cutoff that you could use to assign function to an unknown protein for different sets of, of proteins. And, and organizing these proteins into superfamilies is a way to at least grab a group of proteins that are evolutionarily related that we can start to ask, what would those thresholds look like? And what would be the range of thresholds we need across the whole superfamily? So we think all of these proteins do the same thing with the yellow color and all of the proteins down here. These guys, these green guys, all are dipeptide epimerases. And we just recently uh, submitted a paper where docking, in silico docking by Matt Jacobson, has teased out different ligands that bind to each of these groupings. And that does track pretty well with the clustering we get here, the grouping we get here. So we're starting to make some headway on this problem, but it's taken a lot of analysis and recognition of how really difficult this problem is. How am I doing on time? I'm OK? OK. We've done a lot of work to ask, you know, what are we really seeing in these networks? And one of, the, one of those analyses has been comparison of a number of distance metrics for generating these networks. So you'd really like to use distances from a phylogenetic tree, for example. That would probably be the best way to go. Failing that, you'd like a high quality multiple alignment. Well, we need to make hundreds of these networks, and we have not only a superfamily network, summary network for each superfamily, but we have, want to generate networks for all the subgroups and all the families we've identified. Put them in our database and make them available for our biologist <coughs> users to download. And so we have to have a fast way to do this. So we wanted to know how bad bat blast was going to be as a metric. As it turns out, for comparing two families and looking that are in the superfamily, so they're related to each other, but they have different functions. The correlation between BLAST and a Smith-Waterman uh, pairwise comparison, a multiple alignment, or the distances from a tree are really very good. For comparison with uh, this protein and another family, they're not as good as we get to multiple alignments and phylogenetic trees, but there's still reasonable enough correlation for us to develop hypotheses from. And again, that's what we're after. Uh, we've also done some additional uh, validation analysis, and we put all of that methodology uh, and the, the plots uh, in this little paper that we published several years ago uh, so that other people could use it, and we didn't have to put all of that in our methods every time we wrote a paper. So the next thing we have had to do was to deal with the size limitations of cytoscape and, in fact, generating edges in a reasonable time frame. And so we've done that with, with a program called Pythoscape, so named by the graduate student in my lab who built it. And what he did is he built a, a framework for managing uh, uh, creation of similarity networks. And what that generates is what we call representative networks. And they give us some summaries that we can start from, and then we can go what we're trying to do here is identify subgroupings that we can start to identify and then go back and make full networks with all the sequences of these smaller subgroupings. So the representative nodes can contain uh, hundreds of sequences, nearly 1,000 sequences in some cases. They're binned at a simple pairwise identity threshold uh, in order to, us, to, us, to generate quick calculations and give us a sense of, of what the overall similarity is. Here's our representative network. Here's our full network of the same data from the glutathione transferases. 
And then there are plugins to, to manage different kinds of networks, to choose what we're going to use as the similarity metric. Uh, we can do structure-based networks. We're working on other kinds of networks. Uh, we're interested in ligand-based networks, for example. This is done outside of Cytoscape. It's just a way for us to manage the information on a large scale and then be able to generate those networks so that we can uh, then move ahead with uh, working with it in Cytoscape. Applications, I want to give you a, just a couple of quick examples. The first one is a global analysis of a very well-studied su studied superfamily. These are the enzymes called the glutathione transferases, uh, sometimes abbreviated as GSTs. They have a fundamental catalytic step that is associated with conserved aspects of the architecture. I'm not going to spend time on. Structural variations across the superfamily distinguish what are called classes within it. Sequence identity across uh, most of the structurally similar mammalian classes is about 20 to 30 percent, which is pretty low. It's much lower across the much larger group that includes the bacteria and a uh, number of other uh, organisms. We have about, it's actually about 13,000 sequences now, if I remember correctly, broadly represented across uh, many, many different organisms. And these proteins are important because they play major roles in detoxification of xenobiotics. They're a primary route for metabolism of endogenous compounds as well as drugs. Uh, in a number of bacteria, they're involved in what we think of as biodegradation pathways to get rid of toxic uh, compounds, halogenated aromatics, for example. The bugs think this is a great way to live because they're the only organisms that can live on that stuff, and so they have an ecological niche to themselves frequently. So they have broad and important biological functions. So they've actually been the subject of thousands of studies. A lot of their functionally important motifs have been identified. There have been phylogenetic analyses of different classes of GSTs, and lots of pairwise structure comparisons where the structure of one protein was compared against the structure of another. But until we did this study, there was no global study or view of this whole set of proteins. This is a simple hierarchical clustering of the sequence data uh, that we did as, as an initial step in the study. And then we generated a structure similarity network of about, um, I think there were about 160 structures. We just took a, a, a set of representative ones, and the FAST algorithm does pairwise comparisons, somewhat analogous to BLAST, uh, but here comparing the fold. This is a highly statistically significant score, and it represents alignments with, with quite good similarity across uh, the majority of the protein. These proteins are about 200 amino acids. So if we paint these uh, proteins by the known classes, and these classes, by the way, are not known functions. They're groups of proteins that relate to each other. We only know the actual, the actual molecular function of a tiny handful of these proteins, despite the fact that there are, there's an international meeting every two years on these proteins. It's very, very well studied, but, but in a very punctate way, so that we only know a little bit about a few of the, well, a fair amount about a few of the proteins and almost nothing about most of them. Recognition that there was this really significant uh, subgrouping of the GSTs led us to go back and compare those structures. And what we found was that the two sets use either a tyrosine or a, a serine or cysteine, and now a few use threonine, we realize, uh, in the active site to do uh, the important chemistry. And it appears that pretty much without exception, the position of that serine in those proteins are consistently different. It also turns out that these SC-type GSTs are more closely related to the th other thyroid oxygen fold proteins than the mammalian type. And that's of real interest in trying to think about the evolution of these proteins. Here is the sequence similarity network we generated in 2009. We had about 6,000 sequences. 
Uh, we came up with about 600 of them for this initial network. That's doubled now in size, the number of sequences. So this is growing very fast. Here our e-value threshold for generating edges is 1 times 10 to the 12th, which is really on the five minutes, the bitter edge of, uh, of statistical significance for this kind of, of analysis. And what you see here is these are the guys, and the big nodes are the nodes that were in the structure similarity network. So these guys are much better studied structurally because they're the eukaryotic ones, and there's lots of interest in them. These are far less studied. But what you see by the color mapping here is that the enormous majority of these proteins have never been looked at at any level experimentally. This is the first time anybody had ever seen this whole space. And we'd got begun to get an idea of how much of this space was entirely unexplored. And I think this is one of the really powerful uses of networks in this, for this kind of biological problem. We've now, we're now trying to sort out the different subgroupings and in order to at least identify the groups that we then want to start asking what are the targets. And this, this superfamily is part of our enzyme function initiative. And so we have some resources to do that. Another important aspect of this is the annotation and misannotation. This is the same figure I showed you at the beginning. What I wanted to show you here is here's a protein that clusters <coughs> with the proteins, the fucanate dehydratases. It's annotated in GenBank as a mandalite racemase. All of these proteins, we've, we have a number of experimentally confirmed fucanate dehydratases and then criteria to assign these as fucanate dehydratases. The known mandalite racemases that are a completely different cluster. And what we'd like to be able to do is to allow users to come in with a sequence or sequences, we'll place them in this context, in the superfamilies in our database and send them back a network like this. So imagine that instead of doing BLAST, you're still doing BLAST here, but you're getting a much richer context. And I think this is a very powerful way to look at the structure function mapping in this kind of, of uh, data. Models for annotation of metagenomic sequences. So I don't know if you can see the colors very well, especially from the back, but all of these colors refer to groups of proteins that we have uh, annotated as having a particular acid sugar dehydratase function. That's utilization of carbon. So we then said everything in white is in our database, meaning it's in GenBank because we update that frequently, but we don't know what any of these white guys do. But we think they're all acid sugar dehydratases. We only have one example of a protein in this set that isn't an acid sugar dehydratase. And everything that is brown is in the human gut uh, microbiome. There's lots of these that we can now annotate because they cluster with other proteins where they have very similar features to the ones that we know. And we think this is going to be a higher quality kind of annotation that we get from the sort of flat thing you get from doing BLAST or even using hidden Markov models because these guys are really messy in terms of overlapping uh, models. But we also have a number of these groupings, and this is at uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 44. When the we take this apart, it's easier to see. But we have a number of these groupings that only have brown nodes. And that means the human gut microbiome has members of this superfamily where we know something about how the fundamental chemistry works to do carbon metabolism. And they're not, they don't look like anything in GenBank. So they're complete unknown. They're really something new. And this is a way for us to capture that kind of information and start to tease out which ones are different and then start to ask the questions, should we, go, should we get a structure? Shall we do some screens with acid sugars to start seeing what they are? Because these could be medically important, for example, to know what these proteins do. How these fit in our database, our database captures a lot of different kinds of information where we're really trying to link functional properties to various aspects of sequence and, and structure. Uh, we already provide networks for download at the family, superfamily, and uh, subgroup level for those that we have in the database. Again, it's a small database. 
it's only a, a very few of these kinds of superfamilies. Future plans, we want to curate the entire functionally diverse enzyme universe with this same kind of hierarchical information so that we don't over annotate when we don't have evidence to assign a protein to a family. Maybe we can only assign it to a superfamily and put it in a subgroup that at some point is going to be relevant when somebody looks at it. Very quickly to finish this up, because I know I'm running out of time, we're now in the position where, where we essentially have to automate this analysis. Up till now, we've been exploring it and using experimental intuition and uh, results to validate what we think we're seeing, and now we're ready to, to automate. Um, so we need to do automated clustering of representative nodes, and then we're applying a similarity threshold to that data in order to identify subgroups. Um, so here is the glutathione transferase superfamily now um, with the manually defined subgroups uh, with the aid of experts in this biological domain mapped onto the whole superfamily. It's about 10,000 sequences. Here is the same network where we've simply colored it by the MCL clusters. And what's really nice is the clusters look like they map very well to these groupings. Now, to be fair, the coloring here is based on sequence similarity, so it's basically the same view, but, it's, but this was done entirely automatically, and this was done with a great deal of blood, sweat, and tears. If we look at a more detailed example, uh, we get a similar kind of result, so that the MCL clustering looks like at least for the purposes of doing this on a large scale and in an automated way, we're going to be able to do this. We're, we're going to look at it at multiple other superfamilies. Almost done. Um, so we're now developing the infrastructure to do this on a large scale and automated way. And this is, again, the glutathione transferases. This time we're looking at the MCL clusters. I've only colored the, um, the biggest clusters just because they're easier to see. And the node size denotes the number of sequences per node. And then what we want to do is associate interesting and useful characteristics with that clustering. And this is just to give you some examples. We look at the availability of structures. If we have groups in here that we really want to know about, we don't have a structure, we can go get it. Here's phylogenetic diversity. Here's predicted enzyme commission numbers. They're a proxy for known reactions. There are very few that we know anything about here, this being one of the few. This, these guys include guys that work in uh, main metabolism as well as a related uh, protein that is involved in the degradation of tetrachlorohydroquinone, which is a really toxic halogenated uh, compound that comes from wood preserving. Here's microbes online data. Do we have a signal that there's a genomic context so we can start using that? Of course, we want to include and add these other kinds of data into the networks. So we're in the process of, we've been doing that um, on a sort of one-off level, but now we're trying to automate the process. A few challenges. We have to know what signal we're picking up. Or is, how big is the alignment that we're actually picking up with BLAST? That's something that uh, we're developing the the tools to do this in an automated way. Um, interpretation is sensitive to many different factors, uh, especially there are a lot of, of scores represented in those edges across our networks. And we could certainly do weighting of the edges to get or, or use heavier lines or something like that. But the simplicity of these representations is part of what makes them so useful to biologists in developing new hypotheses. BLAST is fast, but it's really only the beginning of a hypothesis, and that's, uh, that's something I want to emphasize. Acknowledgements, people who did some of the work in my lab, our collaborators, uh, Tom Farron's resource, and especially Scooter, who we've worked with for a long time, and the Enzyme Function Initiative, and that's it. I hope I didn't go too far with it. Sure. Um, 
Uh, first of all, MCL is actually it's actually a type of label propagation algorithm. That's why it works so well. Okay, great. <laughs> I didn't know that. The, 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 other, as, as the other thing is is that we've experimented a tiny bit with trying to use protein similarity networks to predict function. We have this trick that we use, and I'm wondering if you've tried it, if it, if it works at all for, for sure. your thing, where instead of cutting off at a specific value, we cut off at a certain number of edges. Yeah, you know, I think we did some early on analysis with that. Um, but we, we didn't follow it up. The, the thresholds were really useful to us, and but we'll, we'll try it. Yeah, what, what do you think is the advantage? Um, well, it, it just seems to work better. Okay. Well, we'll take that and see what we think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is Leonard's. Leonard. Yeah, we actually have a, uh, an automated way to pick a starting threshold okay. to use. And it's it's pretty simple, but it's where the point of inflection is in the the distribution of scores we get, and it works. It actually works really well, and it's basically the smallest number of edges in oh. that distribution where we see an inflection. Oh, great! Okay, we'll yeah, talk about it it's later. published. Actually, it came out of Tom's group. So, okay, yeah. Yes. Um, and, but I was also curious about the one thing, if I was to sort of guess sort of how much you give up, presumably you give up some evolutionary Because your interpretation of phylogenetic evolution of that. Yes. Um, so that's what I mean when there's no evolutionary model there. Exactly. So, so, so if you're going to say you're going to come to evolution, Yes, and I. Well, to to step back, ev the the mathematics of evolutionary tree reconstruction shouldn't work for these kinds of proteins because they're just plain too distant. We haven't sampled the data well enough, and we never will, because if we want to compute the ancestral nodes, the intermediate nodes, we're getting thousands and thousands of equally optimal answers. The other thing, though, that I wanted to mention and I didn't about the value of this approach relative to trees is in trees you have to choose an optimal best neighbor for your sequence. You don't see multiple connectivity. This is an n-dimensional matrix. So you're actually, for every sequence in your matrix, you've got all of its connections. Then, of course, we smush it down to two dimensions to look at it. And we certainly lose some information, but, but our, our analysis but suggests we don't lose too much. The inference there is that those two have the most recent Yes, that, that's, that's exactly right. That's, right. that's the reason why that was justified at the time. That's right. right. And that's exactly right. Yeah. But, but, but 